Hello, this is Tanya with Peddler's Den. The Peace on Earth multi-technique class is scheduled to, um, to run right now. And when I scheduled this, I didn't realize it was going to be while the flash sale was still going on. So we're going to give this a try. Um, I need to double check and make sure that everything is looking correct. Give me a half a second. All right, it looks good. I am here by myself. I had to step away and double check that on a computer, but here we go. This class was developed to um, basically teach scene building and masking. Uh, we've been teaching this at the expos we've been going to, and um, we only have an hour. So uh, what we're probably going to have to the way I've formatted the class was that we would work some, then we would go to the next step, and we would work some and go to the next step, and so forth. Um, you may see me flipping between cards. Now, you'll notice that these two scenes are not identical. On this one, the fence is over here with the deer here. On this one, the fence is over here with the deer here. Every time you build a scene, there's going to be differences. And um, that's okay. I mean, this is supposed to be art. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut our mask. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember if I just gave you Eclipse tape or if I gave you pre-stamped Eclipse tape. But you take your Eclipse tape, and if it's not already stamped, we have to stamp the snow on it. So I'm going to ink up my snow. And let's see, how do I want to do this? I think I'm going to do this double-sided. I'm going to do it like this. Sometimes doing it double-sided gives you maximum value. Alrighty. Scissors. Scissors, they're right here. Sometimes it's amazing that they don't bite. Anyway, so for the purposes of this, we're going to cut just below the line or on the bottom edge of the line. And in a moment, I'm going to show you what that looks like. I know, I hate dead air, but sometimes when I'm cutting or doing other things, we end up with dead air. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. I have cut the line off, but I have cut right on the bottom edge of that line, okay? So now we have our mask. And we're going to start with a, a blank piece of cardstock. Now this is our top selling cardstock. This is our 100 pound semi gloss coated both sides. There's a few things you want to know about this paper. First of all, the front side and the back side are identical. So I always tell people that if you are careful not to get the back side dirty, you have a free do-over. The other thing is, this is coated. That means that the surface is, for the most part, non-porous. So your ink dries by evaporation, not by absorption. 
and that's important. You need to use either a solvent-based ink like Stazon or a dye-based ink. Uh, we're using the Memories Black. I've had a lot of people bring hybrid inks to class because they don't know the difference between a hybrid and a dye-based ink. A lot of companies tell them they're the same and they're not. Uh, your hybrid inks won't dry effectively on this paper. Uh, a good example of that is Versafine. Versafine is not going to dry effectively on this paper. Um, so anyway, we're going to get started. Now, like we, like we said, each time I do this, it's a little different. You can see that this snowbank is a little flatter than this one, which is a little more slanted. We're going to kind of build our, our banks of snow, and you, you can do it any way you want. Um, all right, let's see what that looks like. Okay, that looks good. Now, because we're using clear stamps, a lot of times you can actually line up where the stamp is going to be without masking. And that's okay. But if you, if, when and if we use red rubber stamps, we usually mask so that we know exactly what's going on. Uh, I'm going to bring this over and do kind of a, uh, it's going to be the hill here. I like these to look like they're snowy hills. Oh, what did I do wrong there? Ah, remember that do-over I told you about? Not sure what I did wrong there, but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do the free do-over. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate it. All right, let's go back and do this one. Okay. Okay, here we go. Now, if I want to fill in here, or if I if I want to do more here where they're going to crisscross, that's when I begin to use my mask. A mask will protect an object while you tuck another object behind it. So if you want to tuck a, another hill or another snowbank behind these, you can do that with your mask. Now this is still wet. And sometimes if it's too wet, I'll use a paper towel to blot it. I rarely wait for it to be completely dry. But if you're new to this and you want to be extra careful, then wait until yours is completely dry. When I blot, I just lay the paper towel on and I never rub the card. I blot. And you can probably see it pulled some of the pooling ink off of it. Now when I put my mask on, I'm going to position it just below the image. So basically what I want is I want it positioned so that the portion that I cut off is visible. I hope that makes sense. Let's see. Hi, Deborah. So now I'm going to come back. I'm going to ink my snow up again. And this time, uh, let's see, how do I want to do it? Eh, I don't like to use the same patterns all the time. So I'm going to come across like this. so that it doesn't look, see this part here that is right here, it's moved off so that now it doesn't look like I just stacked them. And because I masked it, when I pull this off, you can see that that's tucked behind the other one. Now down here, this seems to be a little bit vacant to me, and I don't like that. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to cheat. I cheat a lot. I'm going to lay a paper towel over this so I can flip this upside down, and I can add some snow texture there 
to kind of fill that up. See, there we go. Um, I think I'm going to leave it like that for now. That doesn't mean I won't come back later and do more. All right, where's my stamp set? Here we go. Now, I want to go ahead and I want to get like my fence post and some of these elements in. And on your stamp set, you've got you've got two fences, you've got a building, you've got the the deer and you've got a variety of trees. Now, the tops of a lot of these trees, like this bare branch tree and even this one, can be used to stick up as if they're um, remnants of bushes or sticks or something sticking up in the snow. So they're very valuable. Let's see, who else is with me? Sandy, Sue, hey, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Let me see what that says. <laughs> Sue, thank you so much. Did I purposely make the third image lighter to make it look farther away? Not necessarily. That is a good point, though, because um, when, when you look at some of the cards that are finished, I purposely made some of the trees a lighter value to make them look farther away. So that's a really good question. In this particular case, um, it wasn't premeditated. All right, let me get a, a block and get the fence on it. Now, a lot of times... I'll actually stamp on my placemat first to make sure that I'm getting a good image and it appears that I am. If you over ink your stamp you you get like crazy dark and you know that's usually not a good look either. I think I'm gonna put my fence right here. You always want to press straight down and you want to press firm without rocking and it's easy to rock and slide on this coated cardstock. Now I want to get my deer in. So let me see here. Here is my dough pair. Again, I'm going to kind of ink them up. If you're new to using these polymer stamps, they're not rubber. And some inks don't like to adhere to them really, really well. Um, to condition them, you can take a, um, an eraser, uh, like a pink eraser, and you can rough up the surface. The ones I'm using have been used, so I don't need to do that. Uh, another thing you can do if your ink doesn't want to stick to it very well is you can... Um, ink it first with uh, the transparent Versamark and then go to your ink pad. Sometimes that helps. But at the end of the day, when we're using these clear stamps, we're stamping with plastic, not rubber. And so they, they don't always behave exactly like we'd like them to. Alrighty. I'm going to put my deer maybe right here. All righty. Let's see. Now, going back to what Sandy was saying, things that are close to you appear larger and things that are far away appear smaller. And things that are far away are many times less distinct and lighter in value. So to give our, to give our scene a little bit of uh, that kind of perspective, a lot of times we'll put a large tree right here in the foreground. And I'm going to do that this time. So I'm going to take the biggest tree off of the set and I'm going to ink it up. Bring this around. And let's see, do I want it? I don't want it to extend really above that, so I'm going to bring it down a little bit. About like that. Because we're going to put other trees up here, so I don't want it to extend too, too high. And there we have it. All right, let's see. 
I'm trying to kind of keep an eye on the comments. What type of ink are you using, please? I am using the Memories Dye ink. Um, this works really, really well. It is a dye-based ink. We have we always test all of our black inks on every paper that we're going to use as a um, standard paper. And I have tested all of the different black inks that we sell on this paper. And the two that perform the best are Memories and stays on. And when I say perform the best, that doesn't just mean that they stamp, but it means that when they're dry, they offer the richest blacks as well. In my beginner classes, I always recommend that you always um, test your inks on a piece of scrap paper. All right. This is one of the trees that is bigger and bolder. And in case this is wet, I like to cover. And because I want to tuck it behind, I better put the mask on first. Okay, so by putting the mask on, it's going to allow me to tuck the trees behind that snowbank. I hope you can see what I'm talking about. And then, actually, this covers the whole bottom. But if it didn't, if I had cut it real skinny, then I would lay this across the bottom just in case my tree was too tall and I, you know, I accidentally go too far. So this is kind of a bold tree. We're going to put it, like, right here because it's going to appear bigger, darker, and closer than some of the other trees we're going to plant there. Oops, and that didn't work out so hot, but that's okay. I use pigment pens to repair my images, but you have to wait for the image to dry. But in a case like this, a lot of times what I'll do is I will re-stamp this only over the bottom part, though. I don't try to match it up. And that don't look too bad. Later on, I can take a pigment pen and fill a, a few little dots in, and it'll be fine. That was likely a result of the ink not adhering quite as well to the clear stamp as I would like it to. Okay, let's see. Let's uh, let's do one that's a little shorter right here. Okay. And then I'm going to switch to the skinny tree. And you can stamp this if you want to in gray. I'm going to attempt to do a second generation stamp because even if even if it doesn't turn out real real good, the whole point is that if it's far far away it's less distinct. And it's not as gray as I would like it. You're always welcome to use gray ink instead. Usually I can get the second generation stamps to work well. We're going to try that again. Okay, let's, let's try to put one right here. That's better. That's a, a more gray. And let's see. I'm always I'm always examining my ink to see if it looks like it's even. Okay. 
That's not too bad. Now when we remove, remove our mask, you can see how those have been tucked behind the snowbank. Uh, I also want some over here. So I'm going to put my mask on over here. And again, my mask almost covers all of the paper, but if it didn't, I would lay a paper towel across here to protect it in case I, in case I need it to. Now over here, I think I want to put, you know, one of the, the bare branched ones. So I'm going to put that on. All right, let's see how that's working. Pretty good. Ink it up again. And let's put it right here. There we go. Now I'm going to use this later to put some sticks in the snow and what have you. But for now, we're going to add some skinny trees there, too. Hmm. Hmm. Let me stamp it off first. See, I kind of make it up as I go. Okay, hopefully that'll be a bit gray. Yes, it is a bit gray. All right, let me see the comments. Um, let me see. Why am I not? I'm having a hard... There we go. Um, Nancy, I missed what you used to keep the mask in place. Well, the mask itself is um, a paper tape. It's called Eclipse Tape, and we do sell it. It comes in rolls, and... Um, you can use it over and over again. You see me putting it on, taking it off. It has a medium tack adhesive on it. So it sticks all by itself, and you can reuse it. Eventually, it'll get um, ink saturated, and you'll have to throw it away. But uh, that's what we're using. Let's see. Sandy, I missed the very beginning. What is the type of paper? Okay, both of you are talking about the mask. This is the Eclipse tape, and it, it is a medium tack self-adhesive paper tape. It, in my opinion, is the best masking material on the market. Now, there are times when we use a paper towel. There are times when we use a Post-it note. But the Eclipse tape, if you need precision and if you want to use the same mask over and over like this one, we don't want to cut a new mask every time that, you know, we're moving it around. Um, or if you want to prevent ink from seeping underneath of it, uh, this is the best stuff on the market. All right, let's see if we can plant a few more trees. And just kind of as a side note, if anybody didn't get one of these kits and you want a kit, or if you want to add Eclipse tape or something like that, now's a great time because we combine shipping with the uh, flash sale. All right, let's see if we can get a gray tree here. Yep, it's gray. And... Let's come over here and get one that's... Okay. That's not bad. I'm okay with that. You see how that allows them to tuck behind the snowbank. Nancy, you're most welcome. All right, now... You can see in both of these other ones, I've got some little twigs and stuff sticking up here and there. So we're going to go back and add a little of that sort of thing. Uh, 
Uh, that's inked okay. I'm going to put some over here by this tree just to kind of make it look brushy. And then I want to tuck a little bit in the snow. So let's put a mask on maybe right here. And we'll get some ink going here. And I know that looked ink a little heavy, so let me... Alright, there we go. That looks pretty good, just some sticks sticking up there. Hmm, that's really not too bad. Let's see, am I missing anything? Maybe... Now remember, we're going to put our piece oval up here somewhere, so we don't necessarily want to fill every spot. And let's get a little of that excess ink off. Have a few sticks sticking up there. Do you see how easy it is to kind of scatter some sticks and what have you sticking up out of the snow? Now, on this one I have a big tree in the foreground. Over here I do not. Um, each composition is a little bit different. Certainly if you wanted to put another big tree there, you know, you could. There's room. You wouldn't have to mask. But I'm going to say at this point, this isn't a bad composition. It is similar to these. But because I want to keep moving, it's wet. So I am going to set it aside. And we're going to start talking about adding tone and texture now. And to do that, I'm going to take one that is already dry. Let's see. I don't. Th I think I'm caught up on comments. I will check periodically. So now we're going to use the mask again. But if if you if you rub on this, um, you run the risk of dragging some of that ink off the mask onto the onto your card where you don't really want it. Which is why I kind of did two sides here. A lot of times if you're going to use a mask to do your tone and, and blending, you want one that's a little cleaner than the one that you just got done using to actually make your scene. And when you're going to do this type of masking, I call this color masking, you actually want to cut right on the middle of the line Although for the other one, if, if it was dry, you could, just, you could just reposition it. But when you're doing color masking, which is pulling the color right down to the object that you're masking, you kind of want it to be right on the line, not below the line. So I have cut a fresh mask, and I can apply that right on the line not below the line like we did for the other things. I'm going to take a minute to explain that fundamental to you as well. Probably the there's two things that two things that people really have a hard time with when it comes to scene building. First of all, they don't know what to put in first. Generally speaking, you work from the front to the back of your scene. And the reason for that is you put something down and then you mask it to tuck something behind it. And you may have to mask that to tuck something behind it. The mask allows you to tuck behind. So if you're going to tuck behind, you want to kind of start from the front forward. Now you don't have to mask if you don't have objects that are overlapping that are open images. 
silhouettes you don't have to generally worry about because they will they're dominant they're going to cover up whatever you stamp them on top of but some of the other images you have to be careful of the reason that you put it below the line the reason we cut this portion off and we position the mask low is because this has height so you've got your flat paper and then you have put this on top of it and that's like putting a piece of lumber across it it has height then you take your stamp and you're stamping across essentially a stair step and if you don't position your mask low enough or if you don't cut enough of your mask away you get the dreaded halo which is a big white gap between your images and those are usually pretty hard to fix so I tell people if you were gonna roll something into your house and you laid a plank down on your stairs and you rolled the let's say the the piano into the house there would be a triangular void underneath of the plank where it is bridging the stairs and that is what becomes a halo on your cards if you don't position and cut the mask properly a lot of people ask me how how much do you cut off how, how big of a gap do you leave unfortunately one size does not fit all it depends on your stamping surface it depends on your technique how hard you press it depends on a lot of factors but what you know is if you're getting halos you've got you've got the mask too high you either have to cut more image off or you have to position it lower so I hope that helps <coughs> okay now by putting the mask on here we can begin to add tone that gives us our, our um, dimensionality of our snow drifts for these winter scenes I usually use either light grays or pale blues to you know because to me those are those are cool winter colors let's see I'm looking for comments no comments okay as for tools there's a number of tools you can use these days most people look at this and call this a blending brush and it is a blending brush they come in a lot of sizes uh, this one's actually a little bit large to be working on something this detailed we have what what we sell are called blending ovals well we sell blending brushes too I guess I shouldn't put it that way but we develop these blending ovals and we use them in most cases to paint the artwork that we're going to be painting and we will use either the old color box or the old green memories essentials um, handles with them or this is the handle that we ourselves have designed and had manufactured for us but you have to have something that will hold your blending oval one of the reasons you might want to choose the blending oval over a blending brush is that on the ovals you have a 90 degree angle here you have a sharp edge and with that sharp edge you can draw little lines you can do little clouds in your sky if, if you were doing water you could do water ripples um, you can get little wispy lines and it's not possible to get wispy lines with a blending brush for the purposes of this project you can use whatever blending tool that you happen to have and that you happen to be comfortable with let me see here is the is the surface I stamp on hard or soft I generally prefer a hard surface and I say generally <laughs> for a few reasons um, red rubber works well on, on a hard surface usually now I do have some chipboard under here and I usually do have some chipboard which gives it just a little bit of a cushion I have also stamped on glass cutting mats though because not only are they hard but they're perfectly smooth a table surface many times has um, give in it and it's impossible to get a good image if your table is bouncing and even if it's sturdy and it doesn't have give sometimes the surface is not 
completely smooth. And you really have to have either a little bit of give in it in your stamping mat, like with the chipboard, or you need a perfectly smooth surface. So our stamps are sold unmounted. And in the past, let me see what I got sitting on my desk here. Nah, I think I've only got grip it here. In the past, we covered all of our blocks with tack and peel, which is what held the, um, the red rubber stamp to the blocks. Uh, about half of our customers didn't like it, and then they invented platforms, and you need a way to put your stamps in the platform. So we've developed this product called Grip It. Grip It is a transparent mounting mat that is completely portable. You can put it in your MISTI, you can take it out when you don't need it, you can put it on your blocks, you can take it off, you can move it around. You can use this with the red rubber or with the um, clear stamps. For a long time I was telling people, yeah, if you're buying clear stamps, you don't need it. And I started having customers come back to me and say, don't tell them that. And I said, why? And they said, because the clear stamps work so much better if you use them with the Grip It. So I started using mine primarily with the Grip It, and they're right. <laughs> Who knew? The Grip It gives you cushion. And the old tack and peel also gave you cushion. And that cushion many times is critical to getting a good impression regardless of what surface you're stamping on. Now, okay, Sandy, so I've taken the long bunny pathway around to answering your question. Generally speaking, I do like a firm surface, though, but that comes with some caveats. Let's see what else here. And then, Sandy, I have your blending ovals, and they're amazing. They make the best clouds and rivers. Thank you. I appreciate that comment, but that's because we have this 90 degree angle here. And so we can do things with these that are just quite impossible to do with brushes. There's a time and a place for all of them. We sell all of them. But for the purposes of what we're doing right here, I want to show you how to use the blending ovals if you're not familiar with them. Somehow you have to mount them onto a handle. This one already has a piece of scotch double-sided permanent adhesive tape on it. Now the blending ovals have kind of a fabric backing on them, so it's kind of hard to get that, um, that adhesive to stick real good. So I put it on here and I push really hard because I'm kind of trying to push that adhesive down into the the linen of the fabric and then I'll take it and kind of hit it like this and make sure it's not loose make sure it's not gonna pop off I have found that if you use our tool you can usually use a permanent tape runner so if you have a, a, a Tombow permanent tape runner or any other kind of permanent tape runner, you can usually put that on here and then use these with that. The process would be kind of the same. This one's been used. It, it may pop off, but let's give it a try. So I'm going to put it here and I'm going to press pretty hard and I'm going to make sure that it's not popping off. In both cases, I want you to notice that we've left some of the oval hang off. We do that on purpose. Uh, you, you don't want your plastic to be all the way out at the end of the oval. You want a little bit of flexibility on this tip. I also will generally use one oval with two different colors. Um, I'm painting with basically the tip. You probably can't really even see it, but this tip has been used for yellow and for green. So many times I, I only use the barely edge of the tip to do my painting. Now if I want to do wispy clouds or I want to do um, water ripples or something, I actually will pick up ink 
on this 90 degree sharp edge and then roll this up and do my, my painting with, with just that edge. All right, so far, any other questions? Nope, looks like we're all caught up. So depending on what you're using, I like to work light to dark. Oops, I didn't bring my inks over. Hang on. Hopefully these pads are juicy enough. Okay, so I like to work from light to dark. So let's see, can you see? Let me move one of these over and I will kind of pick up ink like this. And you can see I've picked up ink just on the, the tiniest tip here. You don't want to scrub. That, that's a sure recipe for frustration. And, you know, I, I, I use this motion most of the time when I'm using these. So I can, I can kind of, and this is a real, this is a real, real light gray blue. And I'm just kind of going along here and I'm just putting a little bit of tone in. And yes, I start on the paper or the Eclipse tape to be more precise. Now your ink, when you're doing ink blending, serves two purposes. It serves, and see I'm just spreading it out now because I don't want to, I don't want a defined edge. It serves both to put color down, but even more importantly, it is lubrication. So let me see. I'm going to see if I can use this one to go to the next shade. I'm going to pick up a little blue. Let me see. That's ah, pretty dark. Let me. Some people like a lot of color. Some people like a little bit of color. Like I said earlier, every time I do this, the results are a little different because this is art. It's not a factory. It's not meant to give you the same result every time. In my opinion, there should be differences. All right, now let's see what we've got. See what we've got? Is the camera picking that up? Can you see that? I can't tell. I'm trying to look on, on my phone, but it's in a bracket and I can't see. So hopefully you can see how we're developing that, that gently blended tone where it's the most um, intense right along the edge here. Good. Thank you, Sandy, for letting me know. Thank you, Nancy. So it's the most intense right here and it just fades into nothingness. But by being really intense here, it actually pops the top of this bank out and it makes it appear that it's actually closer to you and it's coming towards you. So now you're going to do the same process any place that you want to add tone. So we're going to put our mask on here. We're going to go back to our lightest one. It doesn't put a lot of color down, but it's putting lubrication down for me, which will allow me to move the ink around when I get to the more intense color, making it more difficult for me to screw it up. Not impossible, mind you, but more difficult for me to screw it up. Set that aside. I'm going to come over to the other pad and the other tip. We're going to add some color here. Because the ink dries by evaporation and not absorption, 
you can uh, you can just kind of keep going over it and it'll keep thinning it out a lot of times I'll go back to my lighter color see how that's just kind of moving things around so if you get a little too much on you you usually can work with it yeah, let's see what that looks like okay you see how it's starting to develop okay I do a lot of turning my card around all right so I think over here I want a little bit right here so that's the dark one this is the light one And one of the nice things about this if, is if you start and you're not sure if you've got enough or not and you want to stop and come back later, you can always come back and add more later. Your paper will be dry and you have to remember that, so then you have to kind of relubricate it, but you can always come back and add more later. Okay, let's see what we got there. Okay, we got definition there. And you can just keep going around like this, adding whatever you need to add wherever you want to add it. On uh, this one here, I've added some down here in the corner. I kind of like to do that a lot of times. Let's see if I can add just a little bit. Kind of helps frame it a little bit. Okay, hopefully you can see how that's coming along. And then of course we're going to have to do some work in the sky. And basically I'm going to do the same type of thing. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to, I'm going to start with my lightest. And I'm still using this, this motion. Very light touch. You don't, you don't ever want to scrub with your tips. A very light touch is best. And this is so light, I'm not sure you can see much. If you need to get real close, then of course you need to come back and you need to put the mask on. Like that. That allows you to get right down to the horizon line. Is this the same right? Yep, as it is. Okay. Let's see what we can do here. I tend to be a little bit of a subtle. I, I, I tend not to like a lot of bold color. Uh, I tend to be somebody that really appreciates subtleties. So on my work, you will rarely see a lot of really bold color. Oh, good, Nancy, you can see it coming. That's good. That's what I like to hear. Sometimes the camera just doesn't pick things up. And now, like, here I would, I would actually try to ink on that edge so that I can kind of bring some some clouds in here kind of drawing them in instead of I see I got a little 
bit of a I think it kind of enhances the idea of a chill day. I'm going to blend those a little bit. So, But can you see those? Can you see where I've got some like the little clouds going on? Anybody? Can you see them? Or are they too light? This may end up being a little too bold, but let's give it a try just for kicks and giggles. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bolder than what I like. But with the camera, we may need this for you to see it. Can we see it now? <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Let's see, Nancy, it's amazing how it comes to life. I know, isn't it great? So here's where we are, and every time you put a, a darker value in next to the white one, it pops that white out towards you. So it's really a lot of fun. Now, each one of you will create your scene the way you want to create it. Um, oops. Now yeah, look at that. Um, on both of these, on both of these, let's see, I hope you can see this. I'm going to tip it so you don't get much reflection. I used a, a Tombow 977 brown to add a little bit of brown to the fence post and a little bit of brown to the tree here. And it's really subtle, but I think it really adds a lot. I did the same thing on this one. If you look closely, there's a little bit of brown in the fence post, and there's a little bit of brown in this tree. That's the Tombow 977. We do sell them. Um, of course, you may have something real similar that you want to use. But I think if you look at this compared to this, I think there's a world of difference. Again, I tend to work with subtleties. But I think those little subtleties make all the difference in the world. You know, kind of comparing the two. Or the three. <laughs> now, if you haven't glittered before, you have glitter in your kits. And it's, a, it's translucent glitter. You need to have some form of uh, glue that will dry completely transparent. Our favorite these days is the Barely Art Glue. It comes with... Um, with multiple tips and the stainless steel pin and everything. And then after, after you use up your first two ounce bottle, you can buy a refill so that you don't have to continually be repurchasing the, the accessories. Um, we used to use the art glitter glue and we liked it and I would still like it except it's not temperature stable. And if at any point it gets too cold, it ruins it. Too cold is 40 degrees. So, you know, it's, it's just too temperamental. And then in a pinch, I use the Tombow Aqua Glue, which has a ballpoint on it. Basically, you paint wherever you want your glitter to uh, adhere, and then you dust the glitter on. After it's dry, if you don't have enough, you go back and paint some more glue and dust some more glitter. I like glitter. I like the way it looks. I like... I like the sparkle. I'm kind of a glitter glue. When you get to the point where you are done, then you have your piece oval. Um, I cut mine out by hand and put it wherever you want it to be. Uh, most of the time I'll, I'll adhere it with a little bit of foam tape so that it has a little bit of dimension, but you can, you can glue it on just flat too. And then of course, assemble your cards. Now the stamp set that you have, because it has two fences, multiple trees, and um, the building, this is like a, a either a hunting shack or a lineman's uh, shack or 
I mean, this is a primitive shack that you could easily tuck behind one of the snow banks, and this looks really good. I know it's a, a primitive looking building, but it works really well with this kind of scene. So your stamp set will give you the opportunity to make several different scenes without having any additional stamps. If you go back and you take a look at what I'm referring to as the snow stamp, mine's floating around here somewhere, uh, this image can be used for sand, snow, or earth. If, if, you, if you put grass on it and you make it green, it looks like earth. So that is a crazy versatile stamp. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see if there's any questions uh, about this. If there aren't any questions, um, I think that probably wraps it up. This typically is a one-hour class, and uh, we've, we've been here now for an hour. I would like to say if, uh, if any of you that have watched um, didn't buy a kit, we still have kits for sale. If any of you uh, are wishing that you had purchased the Eclipse tape or you need the Tombow marker or you need some of the glue or anything else, we combine freight on any website orders with the Paper Purge 2 group and, of course, the flash sale. So thank you so much. Sandy, thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope all of you uh, enjoyed this. I hope you learned a few things. My name is Tanya Weekly. I'm with Peddler's Den. And don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, we've kind of blown through this fast. If you're trying to work along at home, you're going to have the opportunity to, um, to replay it. Go back to wherever you need to replay and, and watch it again. But because you're working on coated cardstock, you probably weren't able to actually keep up because your ink probably didn't dry fast enough. And that's quite normal. Uh, if there isn't anything else, thank you for joining me, and um, be sure to reach out if you have questions. Goodbye now.